once again, it's very difficult to look at the papers, to watch TV, to consume any news really, without seeing all sorts of quite scary stories about the rise, or the resurgence rather, of COVID-19. So I wanted just to look through some of the, the data, some of the numbers, to get a sense of whether things have changed since we last spoke, whether it is time to get worried about this disease uh, and about the way that it's rising, not just in the UK, but around Europe. And I've got lots of charts, I'm afraid, I, I wanna show you, but bear with me, because actually there's some interesting unexpected stuff in there. Uh, and I'm gonna start with some good news. In the middle, I've got some slightly less good news. Uh, and then we'll finish with some relatively good news, some slightly reassuring stuff. So starting with that first bit of good news, uh, and this is, I think, news we should all be celebrating. Um, this shows you the number of deaths from COVID-19 uh, in England, Wales. Similar story as well, I should say, in Scotland uh, and Northern Ireland as well. And just look at how far they've come down. They are incredibly low at the moment. The lowest that they've been really since the start of the pandemic, number of people dying uh, of this disease. And this is probably, of all the measures, about the best measure specifically looking at COVID-19 from the Office of National Statistics. And you can see it's come down from a kind of daily rate of over a thousand people dying a day uh, back at the height uh, of the pandemic. It was down at around 40 people dying a day uh, in the middle of July. And look at where we are now. It's around 12 deaths a day uh, right now. Uh, as I say, it's about as low as it, uh, as it has been thus far. It may well be the lowest it, it, uh, it ever is, because we may well see them start to rise, as we'll come to in a second. But nonetheless, it's worth just taking in that chart. And indeed, there's another way of looking at this, which is looking at total deaths uh, across England and Wales. Uh, this is all deaths, so, so from all causes. And you can see pretty clearly the impact of the pandemic there. That's around the kind of March, April, uh, May period uh, there. There's a few dinks here where there are bank holidays. It's worth just saying the latest data affected by that uh, August bank holiday. But nonetheless, you get the picture. Uh, a big increase in deaths there, but it's come down very sharply ever since. And actually right now, there's COVID as a part of it. So this is the higher this is, the more people are dying of COVID-19. Uh, and you can see that's pretty much the equivalent of that chart I just showed you a second ago, coming down, 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 down. So that now actually, and for the recent uh, few months, uh, fewer people have been dying of COVID-19 than have been dying of influenza and pneumonia put together. So it just gives you a sense uh, that those are pretty comparable diseases and actually a lot fewer people dying of COVID right now than, than flu and uh, pneumonia. Um, but I want to get to something that does concern me within these data and they've just been released um, by the ONS and it's the most definitive sense of kind of where we are. One thing that has concerned me you know, for quite some time, you know, we've had a lot of focus on protecting the NHS. There's a lot of focus more recently on care homes. Obviously, we saw an incredible, um, terrifying increase in deaths in care homes. But we've talked a little bit less about what's happening on the domestic front, so people dying at home. And this I find quite concerning. So well, this chart is basically just showing you the number of people dying above the seasonal average in various different settings. So this is the number of people dying in hospital, and this is the weeks since the beginning of the pandemic. So around that's around the kind of March, April period. Uh, an increase there of people dying in hospital, but you know all of the emphasis was about protecting the NHS, and that was done pretty successfully. Actually, right now, fewer people dying in hospitals, actually have done since, for, for, for some time, fewer people dying in hospitals than, than, than would normally do around this time of year. Care homes, well, you can see, compared with the five-year average, a massive increase in the number of people dying in care homes. You know, this, in a way, was the great scandal uh, of this pandemic. They weren't protected. There was a very big increase in deaths in care homes. But now look, it's come down so it's below the five year average. Fewer people dying in care homes that would normally be dying around this time uh, of year. But have a look at this. This line here shows you the number of people dying at home compared with how many people would normally die at home, of all causes. And it went up about the same level as hospitals. But just look at what's happened since. Fewer people dying in care homes, fewer people dying in hospitals, but the number of people dying above the average, above the average at home, is significantly higher than it would normally be. And that just hasn't changed. You can see a bit of a dink there, but that's mainly, I think, a bank holiday effect. What does it mean? We don't really know. And this is the frustrating thing. People haven't really looked into this as much as they should have done. It is a potentially a national scandal. So many people dying at home. Is it because they're not going into hospital? Quite possibly that they're not going into a hospital uh, for the, where they might otherwise have died. So deaths are kind of transferred from hospital to elsewhere. Or are these deaths that wouldn't have happened 
otherwise, and indeed they're happening because people are too nervous about going into hospitals. I think we know, need to know more about this, and all we have so far are these kind of statistics, and I feel don't, people don't talk about that all that much. Anyway, though, like I say, most of the news on deaths at the moment is actually very much good news. By the way, I should say, the cumulative total we're talking about, 25.4 thousand, 25 and a half thousand people dying at homes. It's actually about the same as who died uh, in care homes above the average. So you're talking about more, more excess deaths probably within a week or two at home in domestic settings than we had in care homes. And yet we don't really talk about that. Anyway, um, like I say, most of this news about deaths, about COVID-19 and how many people are dying is thankfully good news. And, you know, we are down at this kind of very low level at the moment. But as I said, it may well be that that's the lowest it gets, that we start to see an increase in deaths uh, in the coming months. Is that something to be afraid of? Well, clearly it's not good news, um, but it is slightly prefigured by what we're seeing on the continent, which is a rise in COVID-19 cases. And you can kind of get a sense of that by looking at COVID-19 cases per 100,000 in a variety of different countries. So this is France. You can see the initial pandemic. And you can see right now cases per 100,000 are higher. So population adjusted are higher now than they were in the pandemic. It looks kind of scary, doesn't it? Similar thing for Spain. Look, cases per 100,000 even higher there during the pandemic, but even higher now than they were back in April. Uh, and then in the UK, it's starting to come up as well. So there's, you've probably seen some of the pictures, uh, some of the charts elsewhere, looking at that increase in cases in the UK. Well, it is coming up. It's nowhere near quite as high as it was is in France uh, and in Spain. But I've, I've said this before, but it's worth just repeating. When you see charts like this, I'd be super cautious about getting terrified of them. Yes, it does look like Spain is having far more cases than it did back at the time of the pandemic, but that's primarily because we weren't doing that much testing around there. And a better way of measuring how much COVID-19 is going around, it's not flawless, but a slightly better way is looking at the positivity rate. So how many of those tests are coming back positive and if we show you that, similar kind of lines, similar kind of thing, but now we're looking at the percentage of positive tests. Just look at the shape of these charts and how different they are. So France actually weren't measuring this very well back then. So, you know, you can't read all that much from that. But look at Spain. So back at the time of the peak of the, the pandemic, so around April, May, at least kind of, you know, more than a quarter of those tests were coming back positive in Spain. Now you're talking about it's just over 10%. Now that you know, it's a high level, it's a cause for concern for, for many epidemiologists. But nonetheless, we're not talking like anything like the prevalence of the disease that we saw back uh, in April uh, or indeed March. So, uh, you know, those, those charts that you've seen before, same, same thing for the UK, by the way, you know, back in the UK, one in three tests coming back positive back at the peak. Now, it's just over 1%. Again, no cause for complacency, but it is worth comparing what happened there with what happened now. That was a terrible incident. Um, this is quite a different thing. Uh, and so, you know, all of the, the concern, I think a lot of people are showing that there's this second wave that's similar, or indeed potentially worse than the first. Well, we haven't yet seen it in the data, nothing like it. Um, but does that necessarily mean that the UK is going to avoid it? You can see at these lines here, this UK, the UK, the white line, looks like it's not quite in the same league as what's happening in France and Spain. Well, don't be deceived by that, because what we know from last time around is, and you, you might remember this, we were looking at all those charts showing the different trajectories of, of different countries like be it Italy and be it Spain, and you could see that the UK was following on those paths so that at the start it might have looked unlikely that we were going to have 10,000 deaths. But actually, if you had looked at the data, you would have seen that we were basically following where Italy was and we were going to have 10,000 deaths within a week or so. Back at the time, you know, a lot of people didn't like to hear that, but we were reporting it. Um, well, this time around, how does it look? Let's just compare those trajectories. You can see Spain there. This is the number of cases, and it's just a seven-day average uh, of new cases. And you can see it's rising uh, relatively kind of steadily there. And that's, that's where the, the 7th, 14th of September, so we're kind of starting at the point where they passed 2,000 cases in the latest wave of the disease. Uh, and then you can see France. So in, on the 14th of September, they were kind of along that line, but not quite as far, up to about 8,000 a day, whereas Spain was kind of around the 10,000 a day uh, on average. And there's the UK. So you can see we're kind of about three weeks or so behind uh, France and Spain. And what does that imply? It implies that within three weeks or so, the number of cases here is likely to be up from around two, three thousand to around ten thousand. I mean, it does it. it 
That is what this data is suggesting. Uh, you don't know the future for sure, but this is what this implies is that the disease is spreading in this country and it's getting up to, to those kind of levels. So that is an important thing. And, and it does imply, uh, I'm afraid that more people will have to go to hospital and more people will die of this disease because the disease is still a very serious disease. But the big question is this, you know, are we gonna see the kind of deaths and the kind of spread that we saw last time around? And here's where the news gets a little bit more reassuring and where I want to underline that we really shouldn't be panicking. This shows you the increase in deaths that we've seen so far in France. It's not very sharp indeed. Same in Spain, it's going up, but it's still relatively shallow. And what I want to do is to compare that, so yeah, those trajectories, these start in kind of like um, late August, these trajectories, I want to compare them with what we saw in the first wave of the pandemic. Uh, one, two, three, four, five deaths after they went beyond uh, a certain level, put uh, 10 deaths. And here is what happened in the first wave. You can see it's a totally different story. It's a totally different story. Deaths rising exponentially and incredibly fast in that first wave. Whereas at the moment, we've yet to see anything that you would call exponential when it comes to death. So that is relatively reassuring. Uh, and when you have a look at the kind of difference between cases and deaths, and this is something that I think is worth doing, something pops out, something immediately pops out, which is that what I've done here is I've plotted uh, deaths, which is this black line versus the positivity rate. So that measure of how much disease there is in the country. Uh, and this is for Spain. And what you can see is, look, the amount of COVID in the country, this white line, has gone up recently. But unlike last time around where it was moving in lockstep with the number of people who were dying, the number of deaths has gone up far more gradually. So you're not seeing as many people dying per case of this disease as last time around. And as I've said before, we're just going to have to wait and see whether that is something that lasts or whether that is just an aberration. But that's really important. And it's the same thing in the UK. We've yet to see positivity go up that much, but so far deaths remain relatively low. We will keep an eye on that, but it suggests this isn't manifesting in quite the same way in, in the kind of epidemiolo epidemiological uh, sense. But we will probably see, as I say, cases going up and hospitalizations we've already seen start to go up. I saw a chart like this just the other day again, it's worth just remembering that while there is certainly an increase here, and you've may, maybe seen charts that just focus on this more recent increase, while there is an increase, it's worth just remembering it's nowhere near the kind of increases we saw early on. Early on uh, in this pandemic, there were exponential, incredibly steep increases in hospitalizations. So far, we don't see that exponentiality. As I say, we will keep an eye on that, but so far, the news is tentatively reassuring. Um, and the similar thing elsewhere as well, even in Spain where hospitalizations are going up relatively sharply, it's still nothing like the kind of sharpness we saw before so far. So we'll keep an eye on this, these data. But as I say, the lesson from last time around is that by watching what's happening in France, Spain, the UK can get an early glimpse of where we may be heading. And it, here's <clears throat> where a little bit of good news, I think, uh, is worth just bearing in mind. In Spain, it may look like those case trajectories are going up and up and up, and indeed they are. But actually, the growth rate is starting to tail off in Spain at the moment. We'll have to see if that continues in the coming uh, weeks uh, and days. But that growth rate so far is starting to tail off to the extent that you remember this um, idea of the reproduction rate, R, and you remember how one is the important level that you need to be at. Well, in Spain, they think on the basis of their kind of formal measures of, of, of R that they're now below one. In fact, actually, they're down below around 0.5 uh, on the, the reproduction rate. That's crucially important because it suggests, at least on the basis of their numbers, that the disease is coming under control. So they've seen a surge in cases and now it's starting to come under control. If that is the case, that is potentially very encouraging for the UK, given we seem to be following in their footsteps. And indeed, many of the policies that we've introduced in this country, you know, the rule of six, they have got a kind of rule of 10 uh, in Spain, similar kind of policies. Um, so if it is the case we are following after Spain, and it is the case that their disease, excuse me, is starting to come under control, <clears throat> then that's encouraging. And that might be a bit of good news. But we need to just keep an eye on these data over the course of the next few weeks.